Hello everyone. Uh, in this lecture, we will discuss the concept of intersymbol interference, and then we will further in the lectures we will describe how uh, equalization can be used to mitigate the effects of intersymbol interference. Uh, let's start the introduction part in which we have to actually design these signals uh, for a channel which is band limited to some specified bandwidth of uh, W hertz. The, the point to be uh, looked at is the problem of signal design. Because if you understand the theory of communication systems, then the choice with the designer is the design of the input pulse. Input pulse means uh, because in, a, in digital communication systems, the information will be represented in terms of ones and zeros. Now, how those ones and zeros will be transmitted through the transmission channel or the communication channel and how the ones and zeros will be, uh, will be represented in what waveform, right? So that's the point where we have, where, where we concentrate on uh, while introducing the concept of intersymbol interference. The channel uh, is random in communication systems and the channel can be modeled as a linear filter having an equivalent low pass frequency response which is zero outside minus w to w range. That means within minus w to w range the channel response will be there but outside this range, the channel response is assumed to be zero. Uh, that means the channel is considered as a filter uh, when we are dealing, when we have to model the concept of intersymbol interference. Our purpose is to design a signal pulse GT. So that's what I was talking about, that we have to actually design the shape of this pulse GT uh, which will actually represent ones and zeros. Now, the uh, ones and zeros will be modulated onto this pulse in a linearly modulated signal. Now, VT is the signal uh, which which is which comes from when these bits are modulated onto this uh, signal pulse. Uh, signal pulse will be a pulse stream. And it will be the superimposition of the delayed versions of the um, pulses, right? Delayed by capital T time, which is the uh, which is the period of uh, uh, representation of one or zero, right? Then now, when the signal is ideal for when the channel is ideal for mod f less than equal to w. A signal pulse can be designed that allows us to transmit at symbol rates comparable to or exceeding the channel bandwidth. But this is in the case when the channel is ideal, right? But uh, actually that's not the case in practical situations. The channel, channel is random. That is when the channel is not ideal, signal transmission at a symbol rate equal to or exceeding W results in intersymbol interference. So if you're trying to uh, if you're trying to send the bit stream at symbol rate or exceeding W, uh, then it results in sim intersymbol interference amongst a number of uh, adjacent symbols. Now, what exactly is intersymbol interference? Intersymbol interference is the spilling over effect of the previous symbols onto the present symbol, right? Because uh, since the channel is not ideal, so the there is a spillover effect of the previous symbols onto the present symbol so, so which leads to a kind of interference in the in the present symbol in the detection of the present symbol so you may make a wrong decision uh, corresponding to whether it's a zero or a one okay now actually we have to avoid the intersymbol interference in our communication systems and we will derive uh, analytically what is the criteria for zero intersymbol interference. Now, to, to lead to that derivation, we first express the received signal. In terms of the transmitted signal, the channel response 
let the function xt be the channel impulse response. All right. Now, if you look at the system model that is uh, that we will take for deriving the criteria for uh, zero ISI, input data is the uh, is is basically corresponds to ones and zeros. Now this input data will be modulated onto this GT pulse, right? CT is the channel impulse response. ZT is any uh, noise that will be added, additive, additive noise added into the signal, which is from the transmitter side and while it is going through the channel. Now MT is the received filter, receiver filter, which can be a mesh filter uh, for, because mesh filter is an ideal filter and it will actually maximize the optimum filter, uh, which will actually maximize the signal to noise ratio. At this point, because we will, what we will get is xt. What is xt? We will represent what xt is. xt is basically the convolution of the transmit pulse, which is gt, the channel response, which is ct, the receiver filter response, which is mt. So that is what xt is. ht is the convolution of gt and ct. That's what this circle represents. XT is the convolution of GT, CT, and MT. Right. So at this particular point, we will receive a signal YT. We can express YT in terms of XT, which is the convolution of transmit pulse, channel response, and receive filter. And we will receive um, a stream of pulses of XT. And we can represent the stream of pulses by this. Sigma, uh, and going from zero to infinity. And since input bit will be modulated onto this uh, whole uh, composite signal xt, so we can represent yt equal to in xt minus nt plus vt. vt is actually the noise part. Is that clear? Uh, because uh, xt is basically the convolution of transmit pulse channel and receive filter. Fine. Okay. Now suppose that the received signal is passed through a filter and the sample and then sampled at a one by t samples. The optimum filter from the point of view is the one mesh filter is signal detection is one matched to the received pulse. That's what is the job of actually mesh filter. Mesh filter is a filter in uh, whose response is matched to the uh, the uh, input pulse that we have selected. Now we denote the output of the receiving filter. I have already explained how do you denote the output of the receiving filter. That's at this point. Yt is at this point before sampler comes in picture. Now this is a sampler which samples Yt signal at capital T times, periods, right? Okay, let's look at that part. All right. Now if Yt is sampled at times t equal to kt plus tau. Tau zero is the transmission delay through the channel where k equal to zero, one and so on. So yt, yt will be sampled at these times kt where k will determine the timing instance. All right. And uh, sampling instance and n will represent the number and n will represent the sample, the particular sample. Now this can be expressed because once it is put in the discrete form, we can represent it by yk and it says i n because we are only putting the small t value here. We are representing y small y of small t by kt plus tau zero and that's what is uh, basically we are representing. And we can express this in terms of uh, this um, yk equal to sigma n uh, equal to zero to infinity i n x of k minus n, which is actually the convolution of the x with the input input signal plus vk in the discrete form, of course. vk is the noise bar. The sample values can be expressed as, now this is the expression that we get after sampler, right? We will, what we will do is we will uh, separate out the, the uh, 
the value corresponding to uh, k equal to c uh, when uh, we will separate out the value corresponding to k equal to n so when k is equal to n in that case uh, x will become x0 so we will take x0 out and to the second term we will divide it by x0 right so what the term we will get well, because n is equal to k because we are dealing with the present instant what is the present symbol that we are dealing with so i n will become i k plus because n is equal to k divided uh, plus 1 over x0 because we have taken x0 out of the bracket sigma n equal to 0 to infinity but not for n, e n, n is not equal to k because this particular term we have extracted out from this uh, sigma value i n x of k minus n plus v k of course that's the noise part now what is the importance of uh, this manipulation that we have done is that i k if because x0 is a scaling factor only let's come to the uh, next slide we regard x0 as an arbitrary scalar factor and if we assume x0 to be unity for convenience in that case yk becomes uh, this expression now this is very important expression ik is the present symbol right that we will be detecting at the output of the uh, receiver right at the receiver side and this is actually the isi isi means it is inter this term represents inter symbol interference the effect of because yk is the output what yk contains yk contains the present symbol that we are trying to detect and the effect of the previous symbols all right and this is basically inter symbol interference plus of course the noise will be there right so ik the desired information symbol at the kth sampling instant okay and this term uh, sigma n going to 0 and not equal to k uh, uh, the upper limit is infinity i n x of k minus n this is basically the inter symbol interference term vk is of course the additive white wash noise variable at the kth sampling instant we have to get rid of this term to make intersymbol interference zero. All right. Now, assuming that the band limited channel has ideal frequency response, CF is equal to one, which is the frequency uh, the frequency domain um, uh, frequency response of the channel uh, for mod f uh, between minus w to w within the range the channel response the frequency response is one that means constant then the pulse x that means it is kind of ideal response then the pulse xt has a spectral characteristic so th this will be the spectral characteristics of the pulse in expressed in terms of um, the x signal we are interested in determining the spectral properties of the pulse actually that's the important point for because we have to make this term as zero, we must determine the spectral characteristics of this pulse. Because as I told you, at the hands of designer, if you look at the communication theory a little more deeply, then you will see that at the hands of the designer, the design of the pulse shape is only the um, design parameter that is in the hands of the designer, which the designer can control. All right. Now, we have to look for the spectral properties of the pulse XT that results in no intersymbol interference. Now, we know this term, we have obtained this term YK after the sampling of YP signal, we have obtained this term. This is the present symbol that we are trying to detect. This, this part is the ISI part and this part is the additive white Gaussian noise part. Now, Nyquist pulse shaping criteria says that, that which is the Nyquist condition for zero ISI, the necessary and sufficient condition for xt to satisfy that x of nt at the present instant must be equal to 1, otherwise it will be equal to 0. Right? This is the uh, time domain uh, explanation of the uh, condition. But if you take the Fourier transform of this signal, that will come out to be sigma m going from minus infinity to infinity because this is in terms of spectra. 
x x of f plus m by t is equal to t. Now let me explain this um, uh, the Fourier transform part. It says that the spectra of the um, x of the pulse when delayed the spectra because this is a range of pulses that is coming at the receiver the range the index that will determine the number of pulses the various pulses that are coming to the receiver uh, that is determined by this index m now m is an index let's say m is uh, 0 it will be xf let's say m is 1 it will be xf plus 1 by t which is delayed by 1 by t when m is equal to 2 this would be 2 by t this would be delayed further delayed that means it is a uh, i mean it is a whole range of spectra that we that we are summing here the sum of the the summation of all the spectra of the uh, xt pulse that is coming at the receiver end should the spectra the frequency spectra of all those pulses should be a constant t that means when the various spectra will be superimposed on each other, when the various spectra are uh, received at the receiver, uh, after delayed by 1 by t, multiples of 1 by t, then the summation, the superimposition of those spectra, uh, the, the whole spectra should lead to a constant uh, uh, spectrum, constant value. That's what is, now if we are able to design the pulse shape in such a way that when the pulses uh, received at the receiver, when they, because they will be super, they will be superimposing each other because of the intersymbol interference. But if the spectra, the summation of all the spectra is a constant at the, if we are able to maintain that as a constant, then we will be able to avoid intersymbol interference completely. That is the Nyquist condition for zero ISI. Now let us look at the various cases. The cases now along the y-axis is this spectra, uh, where uh, we, we have expressed it in terms of n, where uh, uh, n goes from minus infinity to infinity, f of plus n by t. We have replaced m with n, and uh, what it says, it's basically giving the spectra, the summation of the spectra. Now the first case says that. If the uh, sampling period is less than one over, um, uh, if the sampling period is less than one over two W, that means the uh, sampling frequency, the sampling uh, frequency is greater than two W, which is the, no, which is which are the, I mean the channel characteristics, the channel bandwidth, minus W, two W is the uh, is the uh, the spectra of the pulse. Now, if we are sampling at greater than this value, that means the uh, if we are sampling uh, frequency is greater than this value from minus w to w, that means the spectra of the pulses received will be separate uh, from each other. But since at this part, what is the summation of the spectra? A summation of the spectra is not constant, rather not constant value. It is giving zero here. It is giving zero here, right? So at this rate, if we choose this rate, there exists no pulse whose spectra replicates replicates had to form a flat spectrum. So ISI is inevitable at this rate. ISI will be present in this case because uh, the condition for Nyquist uh, criteria for zero ISI is that the spectra has to be a flat spectrum. All right. Now this is not a valid case. If you want to keep the ISI low. Now the second case is when it is equal to um, uh, 2w. In that case the spectra will be uh, I mean fine but still there will be ISI present because at the joining of the uh, two spectra the, the condition of the zero ISI will not be maintained. The illustrated pulse obviously doesn't satisfy the Nyquist criteria for zero ISI the only pulse which satisfies the Nyquist criteria is the simple rectangular spectrum. Now, if, if we choose the pulse which are which actually overlap with each other, the spectra at the receiver side will overlap with each other. In that case, the, the 
the superimposition values, if you add up the superimposition values, then it will generate a flat spectrum, right? At this rate, when 1 by t is less than 2w, that means the spectra of the other pulses interfere or, uh, I mean, overlap with each other. In that case, uh, there exist numerous pulses which satisfy the zero ISI criteria. This has to be understood uh, very properly because that's the condition for zero ISI and that is the Nyquist condition for um, intersymbol interference uh, avoidance. Now, a particular pulse, now what should be the type of the pulse that can uh, achieve this goal? A particular type of, uh, a particular pulse spectrum for this case that has desirable spectral properties has been widely used in practice and that is raised cosine spectrum. Now, this is, these are the, this is the pulse uh, which is uh, raised, uh, raised cosine pulses, right? The uh, beta value is the roll of factor, right? So if you, if you design a pulse using this formula, you will be able to, um, you will be able to uh, get zero ISI. Now, benefit of raised cosine pulse, well, let's look at the raised cosine pulse first. Then we will come to the benefit part. A popular choice for this case, the raised cosine pulse, beta is the role of factor, of course. Now, this is the, uh, that's the formula I have given to you. And this is the spectrum, the frequency domain uh, spectral characteristics of the uh, raised cosine pulse. Now, what it says is that uh, for beta equal to zero, it has to be a rectangular pulse, right? So, uh, that will not be a good case because ultimately we have to receive a uh, various stream of pulses and in that case the superimposition, the addition of this, the superimposed values if when they are added, they should result into a flat spectrum. Now this is one pulse only, which is rectangular pulse. But uh, due to the channel impairments, we will not be able to get, uh, if we choose a value beta equal to zero, then we may not get a uh, very um, particular value of the particular um, uh, this rectangular shape. Now, in that case, uh, when you if you look at the spectra very carefully, when you increase the value of beta, when you make beta equal to 0.5, the the it will not suddenly the raised cosine pulse will not suddenly come to uh, zero value. It will it will roll off. It will roll off and it will. Uh, extend beyond the uh, beyond its bandwidth. This is for one pulse. The another pulse will also come like this and will overlap with other pulses. So once the pulses are being overlapped, in that case, uh, the spectra, the summation of the spectra of these pulses will lead to a flat spectrum when the superimposed values will be added with each other. And if you if you further increase the value of beta, what will happen? It will further extend beyond the uh, bandwidth, right? So in that case, uh, you get a better um, uh, better extension of the spectra of all the pulses and that will uh, basically lead to the Nyquist condition to be fulfilled in a, uh, in a more appropriate way. So increasing the values of beta will actually lead to the fulfillment of the uh, Nyquist criteria more appropriately. More I, uh, uh, ISI will be reduced in a, uh, in a great way. That means more I, increasing beta, more ISI going to zero. And, but there is, a, uh, there is a drawback here that it will also, uh, it will also uh, take more bandwidth, right? So in that case, you will have to make a trade-off between the uh, ISI and the bandwidth utilization. Correct. Now this is the time domain characteristics of the uh, of the uh, raised cosine pulse for various values of beta. We have plot. We have plotted. All right. Now, if, now if you look at the various characteristics of the various advantages of the raised cosine pulse, you will see that. The benefit of raised cosine pulse, it decays as 1 by t cube. If you see in the formula, you will, uh, if you if you take the time domain uh, version of this formula, you will see that it decays as 1 by t cube. 
So any sampling offset results in finite ISI. If you have any offset, because this pulse decays at one by T cube. So if even if there is a uh, there is a sampling offset, meaning by you, when you are sampling at capital T time, now, uh, if that instant is uh, offset by some value, even then in that case, the raised cosine pulse will decay very quickly. Now with larger beta, the pulse decays faster, right? Uh, but the bandwidth utilization is poor because it extends beyond the uh, it extends beyond the uh, bandwidth um, uh, available. So I mean that you will have to uh, the, your bandwidth efficient bandwidth utilization will be poorer if, if for larger values of beta. Now it is possible to design practical filters that implement the raised cosine pulse. Okay. So with raised cosine pulses, we will be able to uh, ideally saying that we will be able to achieve zero ISI. But the point is that in practical scenarios, this is the condition when the channel is not time varying. But in actual circumstances, channel uh, varies with time, channel is not constant, channel is varying randomly. In that case, uh, the zero ISI, even if you have designed a pulse for the uh, for the particular channel condition, for the particular channel condition, if you have designed a pulse, but since channel is time varying, so you will have to adaptively design the uh, pulse shape to bring the ISI to zero. But this is a very impractical situation where every time when the channel is varying with time, you will have to design, adaptively design a pulse. Because that is uh, not possible uh, practically to uh, design the pulse adaptively as your uh, channel conditions are varying. Now, what is the solution in that case? In that case, we will have to um, we will have to do at the we will have to do something at the receiver side to we will have to design a block at the receiver side which will be able to cater to the effects of intersymbol interference and that particular block which we will design basically it will be a filter and that filter will be called as that process of um, equalizing the effect of ISI when it is not able to uh, hold the Nyquist condition for zero ISI. In that case, that filter part will try to reduce the intersymbol interference practically as far as possible. Now that filter is no that process of um, uh, uh, that process of removing the ISI through that filter, and that filter is known as an as an equalizer, and that process is known as equalization. We will study. Uh, the effects of uh, equalization, various um, uh, conditions under which the equalizer can be designed and how we will be able to use the equalizers for uh, reducing the ISI in the practical uh, scenario. I finish my lecture here. Uh, thank you.